Good. Right. Good. So, welcome everybody. So, so apologies for the, uh, the slight delay there, but we are we're back in action. So, so like a pro. Dude. So nice to see everybody. Um, so, you know, a, a virtual with, with you guys. I'm going to be pointing over there when you're actually there, and uh, for you guys here as well. So, uh, for those that uh, haven't been to one of our mastery workshops. I think uh, there's a few, uh, Chris has done a few, Manchester mm -hmm. first, Keith's done a few. So for those that haven't sort of been to one before. Uh, trust me. Can you see it? Not behind your laptop or anything. No. Okay, I'll just have to use the use old school. So oh, the thing goes in there. It goes in there. The little thing. Yeah. It just popped out. I thought it was that new button. Just dropped out on the floor. Okay. USB. Right. It's not fitting. I've got a new. I've got a new laptop as well, and I don't know where all the things work. Anyway, we'll get back to it. So this is uh, our series of six workshops so we cover time management self-mastery finance marketing customer service and team so they rotate every three months um, and obviously today we are looking at sales mastery which you know we're really going to be focusing on conversion here okay so not marketing not so we're going to assume the marketing's happened the leaders come in so we've got the inquiry and now we're working on ways we can actually convert and actually get the sale to be uh, to be working for us. So, in order to do that, I'm still pushing that. The first thing that we need to understand is a little bit what do you want to get out of today. So, hopefully, you've all got a pen and paper with you. So, uh, do you want some paper, guys? I'll bring it on. I'm going to go get your notes. That's fine. Yep, notes is fine. So, so Jane's got some paper, so do, do make some notes. So first thing I want you to write down is, with regard to sales, what's the one thing you want to get out of today? And uh, write it down in your book, on your paper, and then if you can, can you put it into the chat box um, so that we can keep track of uh, what's going on with, with that as well. So, so if you want to, once you've thought about what you want to achieve, put it in a chat box so I can make sure that I, I cover you know, as much as I can so that uh, you get the best out of your time with me today. Yeah. So, so we're just talking sales here, it's not marketing, not lead generation, it's just about when you get that inquiry, then what do you do to actually convert it? <laughs> what do you want to get out today? Okay, so with regard to sales, what do you want to get? So, Steph, how to get the balance right of tenacity versus closing a deal. Cool, that's, that's good. So the, uh, the pushy salesman, we don't want any of that, but we need to get people to make a decision, not leave them to uh, thinking about it. So. Uh, type of language to use to help close the deal. Okay, yeah, that's good. We'll uh, we can cover a little bit on, on that uh, around. Yeah, think, thinking about um, the words that we use. Yeah, so we've got some NL, NLP neuro linguistic programming tips that I've got a bit later on today. Chris, here. How to increase um, add-on sales. Add increase add on sales, okay. So, up the upselling up side of things, yeah. Good. Um, Amanda? Um, how to ask 
really good questions to get a more direct and decisive response from those yep. who are in that in the, you know, just be no, think about clear. it. Okay, so yeah. how to ask better questions. Yeah, good. I just had a improving the quality of the client understanding and capturing their essence and leading them to a soft, great close. A really, you know, closing without them realizing they're being closed. Yeah. Closed. Okay, cool. Good. You're setting the bar quite high here. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's good. No, I like a challenge. I like a challenge. Uh, so, um, uh, encourage prospects to respond quicker to requests for information. Yeah, okay. Uh, be able to convert more conversions into actual sales. Not my natural comfort zone. Those conversations are being driven by LinkedIn marketing rather than inquiries. Okay, so bring it through the LinkedIn. So some of the, all of this, whether we use verbal, whether we use written, it's all exactly the same. Obviously, the file will be slightly different, but the process is, is going to be exactly the same. Um, and sales without contact after initial meeting. Uh, okay, so if we're not actually doing the sale face-to-face, -face, which I think most of us will have some form of communication, same is going to be true through websites. So if you're trying to close sales, through a website, and I think there's no personal interaction, exactly the same is true, you've just got to make sure you do that through the words and through the way the website works. Mm -hmm. and the process is the same. At the end of the day, if we're selling to human beings, you know, which most of us are, because they're the ones with the cash, mm -hmm. computers don't have cash, um, then we've got to use these techniques to actually bring people on board. So, good, so, the first thing we're going to start with, and I start all of my workshops with this formula. So if you haven't got it already, write it down. If you've been to others, still write it down because it, it's such a fundamental formula. Yeah, B times do equals have. So our have is my goal, the goals, goals and dreams. E is my attitude, knowledge, and skills, and the do is my plan of action, what I actually need to do to make things happen. Okay, so out of those three things, you know, for those that have been to my, my courses before, uh, then you, you should know the answer to this. So out of the three things, which one is the most important for success? Is it who do I need to be? So my knowledge, learning more stuff, my do, my actions, or is it the goals that I actually set? So hands up for the, the Bs. Let's, let's see a raise of hands for who, who's, who, who are the Bs here. Can we have all of them? <laughs> no, you need all of them, but, but one is more important. So not many for the Bs. What about the doers? Doers, so hands up for doers. Okay, so we've got quite a few doers. It's what we do. Yeah, any haves? Any of the have people? I'm sure more of the people have been on my courses than, than this. It's the have. Oh. Okay, so in any, in any aspect, if we're trying to be successful, first we've got to understand what success looks like. Because if we don't know what it looks like, then we don't know what we need to be and what we need to do. Okay, so that drives everything. So when we come to sales and sales conversion, the first thing we need to understand is what do we want to have? Yeah. What does yeah. good sales look like? Yeah. Okay, we can't just go say, oh, I want to be a better salesperson. Well, what is better? Yeah. Okay, because even the best salesperson in the world wants to be better. Yeah, it's just their better is different to your better. Okay, so the first thing we've really got to understand is what are our goals? So Again, on your, on your piece of paper, I want you to write down for you, as you stand at the moment, what is your current sales goal? Okay? Now, I don't, I don't need to overanalyze it. I just want you to write down what the sales goal is. It's a Whatever, whatever you think it is. When I say, what's your sales goal? If you have something in mind, so write, write it down.
Okay, and please uh, put that in the chat box as well if you want to just put uh, put whatever whatever you've you've thought of in the in the chat box. So Keith, that answers the one point nine million. One point nine million sales for the year. Yep, yeah. cool. Uh, to make and even exceed my monthly target. Make and exceed your monthly targets. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Sixty uh, k gross a month. Sixty k gross a month. Good. Yep. Yeah. So we've got 150k, first target 250, double my turnover in six months. Yep. Four sales a week. Good. Yep. Short term is 32k for this. Excellent. Okay. So, so with, with sales, this is generally quite an easy one because sales is a numbers driven thing. Okay. If we, but it applies to anything. So it might be marketing, it might be the team. We've still got to get some form of clarity and sort of be specific on what the goal is we're trying to actually achieve. Yeah. So, so when we look at this and say, right, that's what we're, we're really trying to achieve, what we've really got to understand is that sales target is not just sales, is it? For most of us. Because what did I say today sales is about? Okay, no. The and do. Yeah, but what, what is sales? Sales is. The process. Yeah. Change your change your mind. Okay. Okay. <laughs> what, <laughs> what, what, is, what is what is sales not then? I said it's sales. I'm not here to teach you how to today. Market for. New leads. Leads. Okay, so sales is not, oh, see, as we stand at the moment, it's not lead generation. That's uh -huh. marketing. Mm -hmm. Well, it's taking a lead and converting it to. Taking a lead and converting it. So the sales figures that you've come up with, 60,000, et cetera, et cetera, those are sales and marketing goals. Yeah. Okay, because I've got to get a lead yeah. to then convert it. So yeah. I, I might be brilliant at sales, but absolutely rubbish at marketing. Mm -hmm. So the first thing we've got to understand is when, when we say a turnover figure, we're actually looking at two KPIs here. One is a lead generation marketing lead, yeah. Yeah, one is a, a sales conversion lead. Okay, so if I said to you then, now what is your goal for sales? It would be to increase your conversion rate. Conversion rate. Excellent. Okay, so the purpose of sales is to improve your conversion rate. Now, write down your current conversion rate. So what is your current conversion rate? And if you have to think for more for more than two seconds on it, is that your current or is that the target? It depends, Kevin. For me, where the um, when that measure is taken, is it? You know, for so for I just thought it's a hundred percent at the moment, but it's a hundred percent of people that say yes. Hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah, my conversion rate. People say yes is hundred percent. But you're right, Peter. You know, it, it's it is about where where do you take? Yeah. Uh, so, so what we have to understand, can you, can you see the, the whiteboard? Yep. So I'll only write in the top part, so I think the bottom part is missing. But, so if a lead is here, so a lead comes in, there are generally, can you see that okay? Yep. There are a number of steps, yeah, before there's a sale. Okay, so the first thing we've got to understand is we need to measure each of these steps. So it might be I get 10 phone calls. Of those 10 phone calls, you know, I, I sort of get rid of five because they're rubbish. Yeah? Of those five, three become meetings. Of those meetings, two become proposals. Of those proposals, you know, one becomes a sale. So how many conversion rates have I got? Um, Fifty percent, if you measure it at the uh, point of <laughs> uh, proposal. Conversion rate here, but I've got a ten percent conversion rate. Yeah. So how many conversion? I've actually got one, two, three. I've got four conversion rates. Yeah. 
Okay, so, so this measurement and understanding what our numbers are and what we're trying to improve is vital. Because sales is such a big thing, the more we can break it down into its component parts, the more we can then look at each part and then improve it. So when we're looking at the, you know, what our sales goals, yeah, we're starting to look at this sort of, all, all of these different things that actually make it up. So our first thing is if, we, if we're looking at our annual turnovers or a monthly target, we've got to decide whether that's existing business, yeah, so am I going to get that from my existing client base or is it new business? Now, for car sales, it's generally all going to be new business. Yeah, for kitchen sales, it's generally going to be all business. But for some of us, yeah, Pete, for you as you get going, your, some of your sales target is going to be recurring income anyway. Okay, so we need to split. If it's a, you know, say it's a £100,000 sales target, I need to split that into new business, existing business. Yeah, and if you want to know about increasing revenue from existing business and that's what i do in the customer mastery workshop yeah to get new business i need more leads when i do that in the marketing workshop and we can focus in on what is actually the sales okay so we've got to start thinking when we when we talk about anything to do with sales and marketing is the first thing we need to know is our numbers okay so 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 Steph, you know, 67.8% over the last 12 months. Fantastic. You know, that, that's a, now we've got a specific number. So the question then, Steph, is, okay, so what do you want it to be? What's your target? Yeah, so if our target is 75%, 80%, great. Then, we can, then we've got something we can actually work towards now. Now we need to know who we need to be and what we need to do to include that. Okay, so, so really knowing our numbers, if we're a big organization, we might have to break this down into departments, down into products. Okay, so I might have 10 products, right? so I need to know what my sales targets for each of those products are, for each of the departments are. Yeah, if we, if, we, if we all sit there and say, I just want a sales target, there's it's, it's too many variables within that for us to, to really focus on it. Break it down, Measure it, put it back together again, or measure it, improve it, put it back together again, and then you've got a good chance of achieving that target. Okay, the same when we do our budgeting. If we're budgeting, forecasting, we should go through this process of, right, how much existing clients are going to come back and buy from us? Yeah, how many more, how much new business do I need? And therefore, we can actually set our sales budgets from ground up rather than just say, well, I'll take last year and add 10%. And that's a, that's a lazy way of budgeting. Okay, so that's our first thing is we've really got to get clarity what we want to have within our, our business. And for sales, we are really looking at that conversion rate. So how many of those leads do I get in, do I actually convert? Okay, on top of that, we then go into average transaction value. So, you know, what is our units times average pounds so what is our so that, that's your point is like now upselling cross-selling can i get more out of what i'm actually converting so if it's so i'm sitting there on a 75 percent conversion rate which is as good as it's going to get then i would look for upsells and cross-sells if my conversion rate was 20 percent, i wouldn't bother with upsells cross-sells until i can get the conversion rate up Like multifaceted effectively, isn't it? It's yeah. not just about working, it's about even lead generation as to qualify the leads better. So the ones you're working on. <coughs> exactly. Yeah, so mar marketing should be taking this on board as well and saying, right, well, what sort of leads do you want that you have the best chance of converting? And for me, yeah, if you if you're running sales and marketing teams, there will always be a tension between sales and marketing. There should, all, there should always be a tension between sales and marketing. Because if, if, if you as the managing director or, or you know, the, the manager of that department are not achieving your target, and you speak to the marketing people, who are they going to blame for not achieving the sales target? Sales. I say, that I'm producing loads of, loads of leads, you're just not converting. If I speak to the sales guys, who are they going to blame? 
the marketing. Then you brought me rubbish. Who's right? I don't care. Yeah. You two have got to work it out between you. Yeah, to get the best quality leads and have the best conversion rate. Okay, so we've we've got to, and this is why you know managing these things takes time, it takes effort, and takes thought power because they're in it. They're they're playing the game. It's, it's a little bit like a, a football team. You know, you uh, your forwards are your salespeople. They're there to score the goals. Your midfield and the marketing. They're there to feed the ball to the forwards. If we're not scoring goals, well, between the two of you, you're not doing your jobs right. So what do I need to do? Do I need to spend time working with the midfielders to pass the ball more? Mm -hmm. Do I need to work with the mm -hmm. sales team to put the ball in the back of the net? Or do I need to get rid of you all and get a new team? Okay, so, so that's our, our first thing, is really think about our, our goals. And when we set goals, and I think most of you were pretty good on this, we do have to set SMART goals. Whenever you set a sales target, make sure it is SMART. Specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, within a time frame. And I always add inspiring and emotional in the end. Yeah, I make them SMARTy goals because SMARTies have the answer. Okay, so your sales team, if your sales team are not inspired by the sales target they're going for, then you're going to struggle. Mm -hmm. If you set it too high, it becomes demotivational because oh, I'm never going to achieve it, so why bother? If you set it too low, they'll achieve it on day three and then put their feet up. When you're setting a goal, the way I've been told to set a goal is you, you use two ways of doing it, isn't it? You look at your costs, you add a profit, and that's your goal. Yep. Or you set yourself a goal uh, that you want to achieve. And then you resource that back yeah. the other way. Um, so the goal is the goal, isn't it? Really, whether it's inspiring or not, because for a goal is either moving away from or moving towards. So a cost up is, a, I think, is a moving away from goal. So these are my costs, and I need this amount of sales to cover my costs. That's I'm in pain because I've got costs. Yeah. Yeah, and I need sales to cover that. So it's a move away from. It's very good in the early days. Yeah, because I've got to live, I've got to put food on the table. Yeah, but what it does do it then as soon as I've I've covered my costs, mm -hmm. dropped up. Yeah. Then you need right. to move into move towards goals and say stretching goals. Yeah. So so you you basically say, Well what what could we do with the resources we have, what could we do? And then you work backwards and say, right, does that actually achieve the profit we want to achieve? Yeah, and then it's about conversion and it's about efficiency and it's the simplification process yeah. and it's all the back stuff isn't it so all of those all those things together come into that yeah. so our air conditioning is taking off yeah. <laughs> okay so we've got to make those those goals smart <laughs> so so that's really you know for us before we even start thinking about sales measurement okay so Leads are measured through the marketing team, and then sales, conversion rates, you know, targets, etc. So, once we've got that, then we look at the B. So, who do we need to be to be a better salesperson? Now, for some of you, are professionally trained for experienced salespeople. Okay, others are doing a sales job, and we might be technicians. You know, don't really have that sort of sales knowledge. Okay, but Sales is one of those things that, you know, we all have beliefs about sales. So what I want you to think about is, and again, for you guys online, just put in the chat box. I want you to put down some negative thoughts. When I say salesman or saleswoman, yeah, what are those negative thoughts that come out? Car sales in the front. Car sales. Car sales. Yeah. We'd buy cars. Yeah. Just so. Maybe not just. We're not. 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 We're not.
So you're, you're describing Chris really well here. Pretty so Chris, much. Chris is pretty Chris, much me. Chris's yes. car sales. Yes, it's so, pretty much uh, me. Yeah. Not interested. Yeah. I see people that say no. Don't ask questions. So, so any any others you want to add, Chris? What's what about you? You're... Oh, I would uh, use a really good sleazy. Sleazy, yeah. Sleazy yeah, sales yeah, people. Yeah. Yeah, so try and sort of you know, smile their way into your affection. Uh, and look, we've we've all seen it. We've all had probably had an experience of it. You know, it, it's basically just bad sales technique. It's just lazy. It's just you know, I've got no, I've got one way of actually doing sales, and, and that's how I apply that to all situations. Okay, so the problem though is when we're not in sales, we don't see ourselves as a salesperson, then these thoughts are in the back of our head. Oh, I don't want to be pushy. Or oh, I don't want to come across sleazy. Or oh, I don't want to do this. Or, and what can happen for, for a lot of us is that stops us actually just performing. It's a little bit like a, again, go back to the football analogy. You know, it's the striker who, well, if I miss the goal, yeah, what are the crowd going to think? What's my team going to think if I miss? Mm -hmm. So I won't shoot. Rather than going, do you know what? Let's just give it a kick and see what happens. Okay, we get emotional about the process. And the, and the big thing you've got to understand with sales, and this, is, this comes back to a, a very deep psychological level, is when a person says no, yeah, your subconscious says what? When I mean, you're asking, their subconscious doesn't actually say what, you're asking what. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I'm no, no, saying. What, <laughs> what is your subconscious saying when, when, a, when a sales person, when your customer tells you no, they don't want to buy? You have a negative response rather than trying to qualify the no. I, I've been rejected. I've been rejected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've done a bad job. I've done a bad job. Yeah, I'm inadequate. I'm a failure. <laughs> okay, a loser. Yeah, your subconscious. You cannot help it because you are programmed this way. Yeah, is you've been basically it goes back to animal instinct. You've been rejected from the pack. Okay? And if you're rejected from the pack in an animal situation, what happens to you once you've been rejected from the pack? Yeah. You die. <laughs> you cannot survive on your own. Okay, so this is our natural feeling of when we do a sale. Yeah, and we get a no. Yeah. That's what we suddenly feel. So that's why you get the pushy salesman, because they're going, well, I don't want to know. Because as soon as I get a no, then I'm rejected, and I've lost, and I've got those negative feelings. What I think is more dangerous in sales is not the pushy salesperson. It is the person that passive, passive and never, never asks for the sale. Never asks the question. It kicks the can down the road. Yeah, it accepts the, well, I'll think about it. What was there to think about? It? You're either going to do this or you're not going to do this. Yeah, if you say no, that's fine. I'm, I'm okay with you saying that. And I think that's one of the biggest learnings that you get from doing sales regularly is you, you, you build up this resistance to the fact that when somebody says no, you know, it's not a personal insult to you. Okay, so for, for some of us, you know, we, we find it really hard when people say no, that we take it personally and we don't like feeling bad and, and that's what stops us doing more sales. The best way you can train yourself to do this is telemarketing. <laughs> okay, because the telemarketing statistics are 1% will actually have a conversation with you. 99% will tell you to piss off. That's a really good way to build up your resistance and rejection. <laughs> Alternatively, you can go, if, you, if you're not married, you, know, you can go dating and just ask 100 people whether they'll come on a date with you. What are you saying about that? <laughs> <laughs> so, so those beliefs are what can hold us back. So one of the key things is you've got to understand how you feel currently about sales. Okay, it doesn't matter where you are, you know, for, for Chris and Amanda, I expect you're pretty resilient with that because you've been doing it such a long time. For others that it's not my main job and I haven't been doing it, I'd expect you to be reasonably low. 
Okay, and that's fine. You know, you've just got to work on building that resilience up because one of the key things is, you know, our sales skills, born or bred. Yeah, you can like it's different. Because yeah. yeah. if, if you think about kids, kids are the best salespeople in the world. Okay, now, who's, have you all got kids? Stuart, you got kids? Yeah. 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 When, when they're this age, if they want something, what do they do? I get it. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> they're brilliant salespeople. Do they, do they worry about rejection? No. When, when mum and dad sort of say no, oh god, that's a real insult to my my intelligence. Yeah. No, relentless. They're just relentless. <laughs> okay, so we are born with a natural sales ability. What happens is over time we build up these negative beliefs. We build this this sort of our fear of something, and that fear force fear stands for false expectation appearing real. Yeah, we create an image of something that is not probably going to happen. Have you added the girl at the back? Just where is it? Everyone goes, <laughs> <laughs> anybody done behind them? Okay. <laughs> the lad in front looks like he's about to throw a bottle at somebody. <laughs> <Yeah>. <clears throat> and there's a lot else going on in that picture. Okay, so, so the, the first thing is what we've got to understand if we're on this journey of learning, yeah, that there's four stages we're going to go through. Okay, and we're, we're all at one of these four stages. So our first stage is an unconscious incompetence. Okay, so I don't know what I don't know. Now, this, this is what I would sort of, you know, a lot of us are in business or you know, we, we're already doing sales. But if we're taking on a brand new person to do sales, they might be blissfully unaware. Okay, so if you're unconsciously incompetent, how, how do you feel day to day? Gloriously happy. Gloriously happy. It's like, the, like kids. I can do anything. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's nothing holding me back. Okay, I'm not going anywhere, but nothing's holding me back. And then I give it a go, and now I realize I'm consciously incompetent. So this might be my, my first sale or my, my first rejection. How do I now feel when I'm consciously incompetent? It's a bit rough. It's a bit rough. <laughs> it's a bit rough. <laughs> so, so what happens, so if I'm consciously incompetent, can I go back into unconsciously incompetent? No. Okay, I can't go back. Once you've learned, I'm learning. What you can do is drink heavily, and it numbs the pain. <laughs> okay, but you can't unlearn it. So you're stuck in this box. Now, if you stay in this box of consciously incompetent, yeah, what happens is you start to use the blame, excuses, and denial route. But I'm not doing sales because of. Yeah. And a, a great one at the moment, I was just talking to a, um, a, a new client, he's got a recruitment company, and all of his sales team are using the what excuse at the moment? Coronavirus. Coronavirus excuse. Excellent. My sales are not doing what they should do because of coronavirus. Okay? Now, if it wasn't coronavirus six Brexit. months ago, what was it? Brexit. It's the Brexit excuse. So if we stay here in this conscious incompetent, I can't go back, and therefore I have to go into blame excuses and deny. Okay, either ignore it, which is denial, yeah, or I make excuses or I blame somebody else. Okay, and this is a dangerous place to be for ourselves, so you've got to catch yourself if you're in that. But if you're managing sales teams, you've got to look out for the signs for this. Because the, a really good thing is salespeople are good at what? Bluffing. Bluffing. Mm -hmm. Selling. Selling you on the concept. Yeah. Oh, I can sell you all day long why COVID-19 and Brexit are ruining sales at the moment. Okay, so we've got to understand that that will come if somebody's in, in this box. So we need to help them to move to consciously competent. 
So now I'm actually learning new stuff. I'm actually trying things out, but it's sort of probably 50-50. Some of it's working, some of it's not working. How does this feel now? Sorry, I was like on mute. Frustrating. Frustrating. What hard work. You remember when you were sort of trying to pass your driving test and you were sort of you know, mirror single, oh my god, what was going on? Yeah, it's, it's hard work at this stage. Yeah? So if it's too much hard work, where do we go? Where, where's our tendency to go? Back to, back to here. And then we have to do more blame, excuse, and denial. Okay, this takes effort. This is why so few people become successful in sales because they're not willing to push through this yeah, and get to the other side. And where we're trying to get them to is a level of unconsciously competent. I'm just good at this. I just, yeah, ask me how, I don't know. It's just, it's probably the 20, you know, it's the 10,000 hours of messing it up, of making mistakes, of learning, of reading, of, of improving until I get to that point. Now, so it's dangerous to be here too long, yeah? Because you just miss opportunities. It's dangerous to be here because we go into blame, excuse, and denial. It's dangerous to be in consciously, uh, conscious competence because that's hard work all the time. So what's dangerous about being unconsciously competent? I'm a bit arrogant. Ar arrogant what's as a result of arrogance you become complacent. complacent and where where are you actually if you're in this box you're actually <laughs> here you're actually unconsciously incompetent about the next level and this is what i see in sales teams is they get to this level of okay and then they go that's it i'm done now that, that's like a, an athlete saying, well, I, I, won, you know, I won a competition once, 27 years ago, yeah, and I've stayed at the same level. You'd never see it in sport. In sport, they want to go to the next level, the next level, the next level. Now, the difference is, in sport, the next level is... It depends where you are. <laughs> wherever you are. Harder. It's harder, but it is obvious. In sport, I always know what the next level is. I, it's, it's very clear to me, you know, so if I play in Little League, I know there's a bigger league. And if I play in Division 2, I know there's Division 1. Or Premier or whatever it is. Okay, so in sport, there's, it's clear where the next level is. In sales, it's not clear. So I might be doing okay and, and ticking along here, but... Is there more? Could I actually be achieving more? Who's pushing me? Mm. Am I pushing myself? You know, is, is, is the organization which I am pushing? Me? So for ourselves is what we've got to be sure is you know, to, at some point we're going to get to a level and the danger is we become competent, we become good, we become complacent, we become lazy and then we don't achieve our full potential. This is why we always need in my book coaching and pushing for what's next. Fantastic. Yeah. So if I said to you, you know, who wants a hundred percent conversion rate? Hands up, hundred percent conversion rate. <laughs> Excellent. So if you had a hundred percent conversion rate, what's wrong? He is untipped. Somewhere, isn't he? Oh, what's it? Gee, gee. You're not right? asking enough people. You're not asking enough people and your prices are too, too cheap. You could do half the amount of work by doubling your prices. Okay, or or you're you know, you're going to run out. You're just you haven't got enough leads. I could have a hundred percent conversion rate, as, as Pete said, of one lead. Hundred percent conversion rate. I rock as a salesperson. I've never lost a sale. We're not trying hard enough, then, are you? Okay, so. We've got, to be, we've got to understand this learning curve is, is happening. And, you know, 
in sales in, in, in any high skill, and I, and I would put sales as high skill as accountancy, as being a solicitor, et cetera, et cetera, you know, 10,000 hours. 10,000 hours of learning of practice to become competent and master that particular skill. Now, 10,000 hours, if you think about it, 40 hours a day, you know, 50, hour, 50 weeks a year, you're looking around about five years of constant sales. Now, most of us are not doing constant sales, so you're probably looking around about 10 years. Okay, so for, for those that are on this journey and, and learning this stuff, you know, then understand where you are in that process. Okay, it takes time to actually build that capacity. Yeah, but that is, um, it's also, you know, it's not practice makes perfect, it's perfect practice makes perfect. You've got to be learning the right things, not just doing the same thing over and over again. That's like me, <laughs> me never having a golf lesson, going out with a golf club and, and saying, well, you know, if I do it for 10,000 hours, I'll be professional. No chance of that happening. Okay, so we've got to understand this is this is a journey, and you know we've got to be able to look at it in that respect. And yeah, the only failure in sales is the failure to participate. Now, if you have a hundred percent failure rate of sales, what have you gained? Experience. You've you've had. Some fantastic experience of how not to close sales. As long as you learn from the experience. If you just keep doing the same thing, so every failure, you'll learn more from the failure than you will do from the success. So why did I lose that sale? What happened? Why did they go somewhere else? Why did they object to the price? That to me is one of the key lessons. That's why good salespeople become better is because they learn from their failures. They don't learn much from a success. It's, you know, they signed up, great, woo yeah? You get paid for the success, you learn from your failures. So never be scared of failing, but when you do fail, what was it that went wrong? What can I learn from this? And sometimes, ask, ask them, you know, just, just you know, fine, if you want to go to most, but just what was it about my offering that didn't quite hit the mark? Okay, right, make a note. Okay. This is a journey that we need to be on to learn this stuff. So you will get situations in, in sales where in we're learning this stuff of what we call perturbation. Anybody come across the word perturbation? So everyone understand being perturbed. They're irritated. There's an emotion that's going on. We feel uncomfortable. Like you went to one mark. Right? So you went to We went zoomed it, yeah. <laughs> I was feeling a lot of perturbation there. Okay. Now, perturbation is, is just us, us, us transitioning from one state to another state. From a state of stress to a state of calm. Okay, so it's a little bit like taking a, a pan of water and turning it into steam. Steam is the nice and calm state, water is our old state. So if we're changing ourselves or changing one of our team members, you know, we've got to understand that they are going to go through this process. At some point, they're going to get perturbed and they're going to show some emotion. Now that emotion could be, you know, the most dangerous is when it's bottled up. Okay, because imagine if you, you put that a lid on that pan, yeah, and heat it up and, and that, energy can't escape at some point it's going to flow. okay so this transition from one state to another is caused by heat and pressure so we, we heat and put pressure on something it starts to change state and that point where water changes from liquid into gas is called the Conversion point. Sorry? Conversion point. Conversion point. Yeah, in, in just a in water, it's called the 
Point, point. That's not difficult. I don't ask difficult questions, guys. So it's the boiling point. Okay, so is the boiling point a nice, calm situation? No. No. Okay, so, so for us learning this stuff, but it also applies to your clients as well. The moment they're going to go from their old state where they don't have to the new state where they do have, yeah, they are going to go through perturbation. Okay, they're going to have this feeling of always oh, is the right thing to do. Now, if you, with with a pan of water, yeah, if it's going through that, you know, oh, I don't like this, all this bubbling around, what's your natural inclination? Take the pressure off, turn the heat down. But if we want it to go into steam, what should we do? Turn the heat up. That's a great tool as a manager, isn't it, to do that? To yeah. Heat up yeah. So sometimes we need to turn it down, sometimes we need to turn it up. And it's this understanding that each of our clients is different yeah. and how to turn it up and turn it down is critical. But also for ourselves, you know, when we're getting this emotion of this transition, okay, into steam, yeah, where we have this perturbation, yeah, that's what we need to understand. Because sometimes we need to keep the pressure on. You know? Keep it going, keep it going, keep it going. Just when you think it's uncomfortable, it's probably a time you need to push. I thought that thing when you said on our call um, to challenge and to support. Yeah. I thought that was a yeah. really good. Just, oh, no. Yeah, yeah, really. Challenge and support. So yeah. support is actually this perturbation is too much, it's too much steam. Okay, I need to turn this down a bit. Actually, no, I need to push you through this. And this is a key thing with sales, is, is that understanding with a client, when do I need to put a bit of pressure on and when do I back off? If you put the pressure on when you should be backing off, then you are a pushy salesman. It's because you're not attentive to that person, you're not in tune, there's no emotional connection, therefore you're not spotting this. You're just blundering here and just turning the pressure up and then you become pushy. So this is why we, we generally find females are better at conversion than males because females have got a higher level of emotional intelligence and they can spot this. What they're not always good at is when they should be pushing is they back off. Yeah. Whereas blokes don't care, they'll keep pushing. So if you can get the balance of the two, then you, you've got an ideal situation. Okay, so we know that we've got to push through. So then we've got to understand ourselves, but also the people we're talking to, about the behavioral styles that we have. Now, I think most of you understand disc profiling. Uh, I don't know, Stuart, have you done any behavioral profiling before? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Cool. So we, we use disc because it's nice and simple, uh, and it's a great one in sales. Okay? So we have these four types of behavior. We have task-focused people, people focus people, so I would call left brain logical, right brain emotional. We have outgoing, extrovert, and then introverted reserve people. Okay? And if you want to know more about this, I'll do a bit more within the, the team workshop, we use it for team recruitment as well. So our task outgoing people are our high Ds, so these are our dominant drivers. Okay. I's are our influencers, so these are outgoing people, people. S's are our supporters, and C's are our cautious, calculating, compliant, effective. Okay, so I want you to just draw that on your pad. Okay, now some of you have done profiles, you know what your profile is. If you don't, have a guess. Now you're, you're just from that, you'll, you'll, you'll know which one of those you're in. Okay, whether you're a D, you're an I, you're an S, or you're C. Okay, so I just want you to write down what profile you actually, what you think you are. And it, it, it is situational, so put yourself in a sales situation and just write down in which one of those profiles you are. So another way to look at it is you know, powerful, popular, peaceful, perfect. Okay, now you'll, you'll have elements of each one, just go with one you think is the most dominant most of the time. 
Okay, so so once we've got that, what we've got to understand is, let, let's say I'm a high D. Okay, I'm a dominant type, powerful type of person. So imagine me as a customer coming in to buy from you. Okay. Now imagine a peaceful person, an S, a supporter coming in. Okay, what are the differences between the two? The needs are. Let's say the needs are the same. Okay, so for you, I both need a kitchen, for you, I both need a car. How they get their kitchen. Yeah. What they need from the salesperson. Exactly, what they need from the salesperson. Okay, so who, who are good at selling to these? What profile is good at? So I'm, I'm this powerful, dominant person coming in to buy from you. These sales well to the D. sales well to the D. Okay, who's a, a man who sells well into a man? That's mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Who sells best to an I? Another I. An I. Who sells best to an S? Sometimes a D. Sometimes a D. They're good at what they do. Yeah. Yeah, but they're not being D though, are they? I do the an S. An S. Yeah. C's, C's. So what if we understand our profile, we are going to have a really good success rate, conversion likewise, to profiles like us. Mm. We're rocking that level. So if you're in an industry where you predominantly get S type people, yeah, and you're an S, you'll sell all day long. Okay? But if you if you're an S and you're in a D world, yeah, you're gonna struggle. Because the, the opposites will always struggle more than the side. C's and S's are okay, I's and S's are okay, D's and I's are okay, D's and C's. But across D's and S's, I's and C's can struggle big time. Okay, so our first thing is we've got to understand who we are. The second thing is we've got to understand who we're selling to. Okay, now we, we can look at this in a, in a way that we are identify salespeople. Yeah, and say, right. So an order taker, yeah. Sits there and waits for somebody to ask. What what profile would that be? Yes, yeah, supporter. You know, when when you ask, I'll look after you really, really well. But I sit there and I wait for you to ask. Should the good salesperson lead the conversation to the point that the client feels that they're asking, or that they're saying, "Okay, let's go to the next step." Then, so you're facilitating that process rather than as a positive rather than negative. All of this can be positive. Okay. I'm not saying any of these are weaknesses. No, yeah. They are there's real strength in a context out of that context of a weakness. So we all so all of this profiles are, there's no right or wrong. <coughs> it just is a good time to use it yeah. and a good time as we'll see to to actually adapt. So so the, so if we've got somebody who is good when they get an inquiry coming in, but they're not good at chasing it, they're the order taker. They're generally going to be your high S's. What about somebody who's the product ball that just rattles on about the product? Yeah, they'll be the high C. Mm -hmm. And knows everything inside out and just regurgitates it all to. Okay, now if I'm a high I, and I get one of these, how am I going to feel? Bored. Bored within <laughs> seconds. Yeah. You know? <laughs> if I'm a D, I can probably get away with it. Yeah, an S, I'll be too polite to turn to sharp. Yes. Okay. So then we've got our overseller. Promises the world. I it's going to be fantastic. You've got to have this. Everyone's got one of these. This is brilliant. It's the I. It's the I. It can be the D, but it's, it's going to be that. It's going to be that external. Okay, so the overseller is is generally going to be the I. Okay, and then the fourth one is beats you into the sale. You need this. This is what you want. Off you go. Okay, now they're only that 
because if I'm a high D selling to another high D, I don't come across as pushy, I come across as efficient. Mm -hmm. The job's got to be done. I want one of those right there, you go, boom, boom, off you go. If I'm a high S, oh, he was a bit pushy and he took, he took me to something I didn't really want. If I'm a C, oh, he never gave me enough detail. Yeah. And if I'm an I, you know, it's what he didn't really care about. There's no emotion, there's no connection with us. Okay, so what we've got to be is the fifth type, which is professionally help the person, whatever profile they are, to buy what's right for them. So this is the beauty with DISC is we understand ourselves, we get to understand who we're selling to, what type of profile, yeah, and then we change our style to suit them. But remembering, we're trying to make a sale. So that perturbation that they will get, yeah, we need to, to, to cut through it. If you think about the perturbation of a high D, why would a high D regret actually buying something or would stop them from buying it? Well, it's taking too long. Could, yeah. This, this whole process is taking yeah. far too long, you know, and so my perturbation is I wanted it now, now I'm bored, I've moved on. And actually, we sometimes find that because people don't want to go through a design process. Yeah. Because, and actually, we had that with a client recently, actually said to us, Look, I don't want to go back to the beginning. Yeah. I've already made a lot of decisions. Yeah. Um, but actually, sometimes for us to do the job we need to do, we need to understand. Yeah. <laughs> so, actually, to negotiate that is, is obviously the answer, but you have to somehow more quickly draw out of them. Yeah. Okay, well, just tell us what you've decided. Yeah rather than trying to score it even. Yeah. So, so you've got to understand who we're selling to, what profile they are, and how to actually best come across it. Yeah. So this is one of the, this is why you know in sales you know, there's a process behind it, but this is this is the soft skill stuff. Mm. You just need to practice really don't you every time someone comes across your path, you're gonna be thinking the big one. Yeah. Why did I lose that one? Yeah. Yeah. What well, profile since they're walking the, since they're walking the door. Yeah. What profile are they? Yeah. And you can tell, you know, if, imagine a high D walking into it, into your, or meeting them or walking into your shop, into your show. What sort of characteristics are they going to have? Yeah, confidence. You know? They're going to walk up, they're going to be quite direct. They're going to be actually sort of saying, you know, what they actually want. Like, I want one of those, come on. Okay, so, that, so the more you use this, that's why we, we, we profile all of our, our clients. You know, most of you have had your profiles. And then I say, look, profiling is fine, but you've got to use it. You know, you've got to be thinking, like every person, you should be able to assess what profile they are, generally within about three minutes. Okay, sometimes you get it wrong. Some are, are fairly you know, similar, mm -hmm. so you've got to sort of work between the two. But... You know, there are ways to actually, you know, to do it. And if you get it wrong, great, learn from it. Mm. I thought they were a high, I thought they were D, and actually they were a C. Because they were, they were confident in their area of expertise, but take them out of their expertise and they go back into detail focus. Mm. Okay, so, so that's really, so we've got our goals. Now we understand that we've got to work on our beliefs and our B and our knowledge and our attitude. Uh, the, the soft skills around what we're actually doing. Okay, if we want to be a better salesperson, we've got to be working on those all the time because that never stops. So the, the key thing I learned a few years ago was there's two things, emotional intelligence, EQ, and intellectual intelligence, IQ. I, our IQ stops developing at the age of 17. So by the time you're 17, you will not be any more intellectual, yeah, as you go older. So once you want you, your ability to learn and your ability to problem solve stops at the age of 17. So if you haven't got it by the time you leave school, you ain't gonna get it. Okay? Your emotional intelligence, your EQ, continues to develop into your 60s. Okay? And it's the EQ that has been proven in leadership and certainly in sales, that's the one that is far more important than your in your intellect. You're going to have quite a low IQ and a very high EQ and you'll, you'll be a great salesperson, a great leader 
because at the end of the day, people connect with people. You see, see some very intelligent people that are just useless around people. And they'll, they'll get certain, unless you're going to be an actuary for a, you know, insurance company, you're not going to get very far with your yeah. intellect. Yeah. We see a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of them. There are a lot out there. There's a lot of them out there. I always think, do you remember Mastermind from many years ago? Uh, the guy that won Mastermind? He was a taxi driver. Oh, wow. Ran the size of a planet and all he could do was drive a taxi. Mm -hmm. uh, so, the first thing we've got to do in, in our doing you know, is to find time. Now, obviously, for, you, for those of you who are full-time salespeople, you know, all of your time, 40 hours in the week, is sales time. Okay, for those of us that have got other jobs, you know, we're running the business or we're doing multiple things, you've got to get time in your diary to actually do the sales. Okay, and if it's important and not urgent, it's got to be diarized. So, you know, it might be like Thursday mornings, I do my sales calls. You know, Mondays, I do my, ad, you know, my sales admin, the quotes. You've got to get the time booked in the diary to do this stuff. And certainly for those of you that sales is a little bit harder, okay, and, you, and not perhaps as enjoyable as other things, then it's more important to get those rocks in. You know, the important but not urgent stuff. And making time to do sales is really important. So, you know, this diary here, you know, we do the sales meetings on a Monday and Thursday. Okay, so I'm booking up you know, to actually do those calls, do those meetings, whatever it might be. So actually physically making time to do that. If you're full-time and it sales is just your, your, your role, then there'll be aspects of sales that you need to prioritise. So think about the one that you're weakest at, the one you, you like the least. It's generally going to be paperwork. Okay, so don't leave paperwork to Friday afternoon. Okay, because you might say, well, I'll leave it there, but you won't be motivated to do it. Always do that. It's a bit like school timetables. Yeah, you remember back at school, first lessons on a Monday morning were double maths, double maths, double English. Okay, it was always the thing that was most important, but the least, for some, the least enjoyable. Get it done, get it out of the way, eat that frog. Okay. Then you've got to understand when, when the leads come through, okay, from marketing, what stage in the buying process are we? Early, early, early. Okay, so, so if we look at this as a, a normal distribution, yeah, if we're lucky enough to get people at this end, how easy are sales? Now, you, you've got to be an idiot to, to lose these ones. And it's amazing how many people will actually lose them because they go, oh, no, I've got to take you through the process. Now, if they're ready to buy, just let them buy. Okay? So, but it will be a small percentage of those leads that will actually be ready. There'll be some that are just a waste of space. Okay, they're never going to buy from you. I don't know why they contacted you or whatever, but you've got to dequalify those pretty early on. Yeah. So I had a call today, you know, and I'd written in my, she, she contacted me about a year ago. She might be watching this. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, it, it was really a case of, look, this is never going to be a sale. You know, you're just phoning up about something that is just not there. And it's just not be worth wasting my time. So I've got to dequalify those as quickly as I can and get them out. Yeah. Okay. Then we've got these people here that might be interested. Yeah. And these people here that they're, they're in the early stages. They're in the sort of fact finding stage. Now, if I try and close these people, the not yet interested people. What's going to happen? Potentially, I could put them off, or I'm going to waste my time. 
But a good salesperson has a very good way to actually identify that. And using Chris's thing, car salespeople are atrocious at this. Absolutely, I don't know how they, what they're trained on, but they get this wrong all the time. Because how many times have you gone in to buy a car here, yeah, and no one's actually paid you any attention? Mm. Okay. And how many times have you, you sort of been just kicking time and then they'll try and sell it? <laughs> they just don't, they, all the years in sales, they haven't actually worked out how to assess this. Okay, so is, is there a magic formula for this? No, there isn't. Okay, you just you get this from experience. Okay, come, I'll show you a bit later about the questions that we yeah, ask. Qualifying, qualifying, qualifying questions. questions. And then depending on your industry, there's different things that people will say. Yeah, there'll be, there'll be signs, yeah, there'll be things. So that's why everyone you, you assess, right, were they there, you, you build up your data bank of knowledge around this. Okay, so we've got to understand where they are in this process. And our job in our sales is to move them up. So if you're down here, yeah, I need to move you up, but it's probably going to be through a number of, number of steps. Mm -hmm. but we know our job here is somewhere around here mm -hmm. is a key step that we know once you cross that line, I've got you. You will, you will buy. Okay, for car sales, it's generally what? Test drive. Test drive. If I can get you in a car, then the chances are I'm going to sell. If it was uh, clothes, try it on. If it's food, it's have a taste. Okay, there's generally you are working towards something that we know if I get you to that stage, then I'm up in the 80 90 percent close, close rate. If I try and close you before that, I'm going to struggle. Okay, so we're, we're really thinking here then, right, what, I need a process then to know how to move you from the left side through to the right side. And the best process that I've come across is from a guy called Tom Hopkins, who wrote this book, Sell It Today, Sell It Now. Uh, it was written in the 80s, 90s, so it's a bit old languagey. It's a little bit hard selling, the old, what I would call the old sort of 80s sales, but the essence of what he wrote about, I think, is just brilliant. Just, it's so simple and so effective. And I've read hundreds of sales books, and it all comes back to this, these four, they call it different things, but it's these four steps. Okay. So sell it, sell it today, sell it now. Mastering the art of the one cool close. Um, I don't know if I'm really on that. I haven't done it as a book club. No, I, I did. No, uh, help, though, I've, 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 I've done things on yeah. this. It's quite a detailed, it's quite a meaty book. It's not an easy read. It's not the best read, but uh, the, the process was good. I, I've read it for you, so pulled all the good information out. So it's a four stage process. Okay. And, and the thing with it is the trust and the need can be reversed you know, if. Somebody comes to you and says, I want that, then you reverse this. Okay? If, so if they're, if they're early on in the process, uh, yeah. But if they're here, yeah, then it's trust, need, help, hurry. If they're here, it's need, trust, help, hurry. Okay? It's just the speed of the, the actual process. <laughs> Trust yeah. Is that that's back on that call. So trust me, help I. So I'm gonna do it in, in this order, but so you can you can reverse the other two. So he looks at it in two halves. One is to reduce the buying resistance, okay, and one is to then to speed up the sale. So we're reducing the resistance here, yeah, and then we're building up the acceptance to the sale here. Because everybody comes when they when they buy, they have a resistance to buy. Mm -hmm. right? It doesn't mean it doesn't matter, you know, I could be buying anything. Mm -hmm. The more the greater the need, the lower the resistance. Sure. The less the need, the more the resistance. Okay? Mm -hmm. So 
So what we've got to understand is when they come in, they are not ever going to buy from you unless they trust you. There's no way people are going to buy it. And the more expensive the item, yeah, the more resistance I'm going to have to part with my money, the more, the less trusting I'm going to be. If I, if I want to buy a Mars bar, yes. yeah, but how much trust do I need for the shop? Yeah, not a lot. I still need some because it might be a knockoff Mars bar. It might be, <laughs> it might be an out of date Mars bar. You know, if, if I was, if, if a guy in the street walked past and said, do you want to buy a Mars bar, mate? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Probably isn't. Yeah, all that. Probably isn't enough trust. <laughs> okay, so so it's got to be. So we we look at this and we say right, propriety, intent statement, commonality, credibility, competency. So it's well, first off, we've got to be proper. So if I'm selling a high ticket item, yeah. My, the trust is going to come from the fact that I bring, bring propriety that matches with what I'm selling. Okay, so if, yeah. if, if Chris, second-hand car sales, was selling, you know, £100,000 Ferraris out of a little warehouse in Romsey, yeah, and I walk in there, what am I going to suddenly think? Oh, that's that's really well, these are a bit dodgy. Okay. Same thing in a, in a showroom in Knightsbridge. Okay. Now, if he's wearing jeans and a scruffy t-shirt, what are we gonna think? If he's wearing a suit and collar and well-dressed, what am I gonna think? So it needs to be at the right level. It's the wrong level the other way. Could be the other way. Has the other way. Yeah. So, so, so if, he, if, he, if, he's in, if he's in a Savile Row suit, right. selling car at a yeah. yeah. well, he's a wide boy. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's got to be the right level for what we're actually selling, who we're selling it to. Okay, so for, for Karina and Alex, who uh, the uh, plumbing and boilers, you know, I'm not expecting suit and tie from you guys. You know, but I would be expecting branded t-shirts, branded vehicles that look good, that are clean and tidy. Because you turn up in a, in, in a 20 year old transit van blowing smoke, what am I suddenly gonna think about the boilers you're gonna install? Okay, so this is, so this is important. Then we move into commonality. Okay, so people like people like themselves. So one of the first things we've got to do in the sales process is find some common, a ground for commonality. Okay? And we do that generally through asking questions or being observant. Okay? Observation is one of your key strengths within sales. Okay? So if, if, you're, if people are coming to the shop, you know, you're looking at what they're wearing. Yeah? You're asking the questions about where they are. Okay. If if I had two people, yeah, exactly the same. One person comes from my school, had been to my school, and one person hadn't. Which one am I going to trust the most? Yeah, but why? The completely irrational thought because they could have been a complete idiot at my school. But we're programmed to like things like us, pack animals, people that smell like us. Yeah, are generally safe in the people that don't. It's been really interesting. I've been my first presentation we to was somewhere in the masks the whole time, mm. and therefore you lose a lot of non verbal communication. Yep. And it's actually a lot more tiring to do meetings like that because you're yep. having to watch for other things yep. and you're having to take some punts. Yep. Um, mm. So I think they're going to go ahead. But yep. that's and that's why phone is, is more difficult because you miss yeah. all, all the visual clues. That's yeah. why video isn't quite the same because while you're there, you're not really, that's why I'm talking to these guys more than I'm talking to you. It's nothing personal, <laughs> you know, you're all very, very nice people, but you know, my, it, it's easier for me to talk to people who are in the room uh, because subconsciously I've got a connection with you guys, whereas you're just a TV screen. Mm -hmm. So if we are doing sales through Zoom because of COVID, we've got to take this into account 
and, and build that into the process and understand that trust was going to take longer <clears throat> through this than it would do if we were face to face. Okay, so we're, build, we're building in this trust yeah, in order to actually you know, get people through. Now, some of this trust can actually be done by who? Before it gets to sales. Marketing. Okay, so our website is going to build the credibility and competency. You know, our testimonials, our case studies. People are going to do research. Now, our LinkedIn profile. So when they go to your LinkedIn profile, are they actually seeing your competency there and then? If they can go and hunt for it, I read somebody's LinkedIn profile today, and after five minutes of reading, I still had no idea what he did. Sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> like, who, is this, who is this man that comes into my, my training room? So everything we've got to do through the marketing, through what we send out, how, how we answer the phone. You know, when, when inquiry comes in, how many rings is it before the phone's picked up? You know what's going to show when you're on. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you cannot help but, but people will judge you. You know, more than three rings, people go, oh, well, they're not always there, are they? <laughs> Answer too quick, yeah, and again, it's bloody hell. They've got nothing else to do but pick up the phone. Okay, so in sales, three rings. Three rings is the time, because by the time you've dealt with that, you need time to think, right, what am I gonna to say to this person? Yeah, so you go one, two, three, answer the phone. All these little bits help in, the, in this yeah. process, okay? So once we we know we've got the trust, we've, we've got the commonality. You know, we've asked them you know, what they're here for. We understand. You know, so that there, there's some aspects there. Then we can go into need identification. And again, don't forget if they're coming to you because they need something, you can go straight into need. So this, I love those customers. Yeah, I need. Oh, I need. Broken down. <laughs> I broken down. I need just been in an accident. It's been written off. But let me tell you. Let me tell you about. You know, all, all the good cases and things. No, no, just bloody well sell me a car. Okay, so, but in this case, we, we build that knit, that trust, we, we build that relationship, then we need to go into need identification. And this is where we go into questioning. So problem identification. The only way we can actually identify a problem is by asking questions. Now, the way I, I akin this is, uh, so Stuart, you've got a bad shoulder, okay? How did you know that? <laughs> the way you've got, got a bad shoulder. <laughs> you've got that, excellent. So I, I am the world's top shoulder doctor. Now, I've studied this for 20 years, yeah, and I can diagnose bad shoulders and give cures within seconds. Okay, so you, you're just coming to my, my uh, surgery, yeah, I see you come through the door and I say, hi, Stuart, because I'm doing my commonality bit, I know your name. I can see exactly, as you've walked in there, I can see exactly what's wrong with you. Yeah, take three of these three times a day for the next three weeks and you'll be fine. Off you go. Because I know, I know your problem. I've seen it, I've, I've done this a hundred times thousand times I know exactly what's wrong with your shoulder take three of these three times a day for the next three weeks and you'll be fine how do you feel about this experience of me fixing your shoulder um, I, I think if I did that I'd be a bit untrusting because I, I wouldn't have you wouldn't have uh, felt my shoulder or, or or done anything to you know just you're just going on an initial look yep. but you've been referred to me yeah, and I've got all my certificates on the wall behind me. Okay, if, if all that was there and I, I, I got as far as trust, then um, probably okay, probably quite good. Probably? I'm a bit of a skeptic, I suppose. Yeah, you'd be very skeptical. How, yeah. how does he know? He's, he's just, I've walked through the door and he's just yeah. giving me these three things. You'd, you'd probably do it if the referral was really good and yeah. my certificates were really, really good. and statistic was there yeah but you'd still have doubt yeah now if i brought you in and i, and I still know this 
Yeah, because I'm, I'm brilliant as a, as a doctor. And I said, Stuart, come on in, come down. Tell, tell me about your shoulder. Yeah, how, how did it happen? Oh, that's terrible. You know, what, what, what problems is it causing you? How much pain are you in? You know, what's the consequences of this shoulder? You know, what are you not doing as a result of this shoulder? So I'm, I'm now probing, I'm asking, now, am I asking these questions for my benefit or for your benefit? Uh, as much mine as your own, um, to give me confidence in, in your yeah. ability. In your... I, 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 I'm the expert, I know exactly what you want. Okay? And it's these three things three times a day for three weeks. You know what you need, not what he wants. What, what you need. So I, I'm asking these questions for you. To give you that understanding that you now know what your problem is. Because at the moment you don't know what your problem is. No. You've got the symptoms, but you don't know what the problem is. So I'll take you through this problem identi identification, this discovery. So we're going to discover this together. And then I'm going to hit you with this sort of qualification. So the qualification is right. So let me just bring this together. Yeah, so you've had this shoulder problem, it's keeping you up at night, you're not sleeping, it's causing you real grief, okay? And I'm going to do one last qualification question. Where does it hurt? Is it there? Is it there? Is it there? And you're going to go, ow! Right? As soon as you go, ow, there's an emotion, now you're ready to bite. If I put you into that much pain by prodding you, yeah, whatever I say now, you're going to buy it. Take three of these, three times a day, for three weeks, you'll be fine. Thank you. Thanks, doctor. You're the best doctor ever. Thank you. Exactly the same outcome. Okay, Three tablets, three times a day for three weeks. But the need identification process is there as much for me, because... I probably wouldn't know exactly what the problem was, yeah, but it's as much for you as well. Yeah. And the danger when we get these confident salespeople is they miss this bit out. They go straight into help and say, right, this, here's the car you want. So no, I know, I know you've got a family and kids mm -hmm. and you, you want a people carrier. You, know, you want this electricity deal. You, know, you want this boiler, you want this. Okay, so we've got, we've got to look at this and say, yeah, we're doing this as much for them as we are for ourselves. Okay, so the, so the need acknowledgement is then, so we, we, we now both agree that this is what you need to do. So if I've got it right, then this is the need that we need to do. The packed acknowledgement is an interesting one, and it's, it's a little bit more for sales where you know there's another party because some people will come into a sales situation and they've made a pact either with themselves or with somebody else that they're not going to buy today okay so there's no point in going through this part if there's a pact there so you need so what's the question to um, the question is is there somebody else that needs to Help you with this, so, yeah, so you're going to buy. And it's generally for bigger ticket items. Okay. Well, I have that. We have that with, with cars. Yeah, that's, that's the problem. Yeah. So, so the people that come in. It's my wife, my husband, my dad. Yeah. So, in in your need, hopefully in your need identification, you would have. So, who's the car for? You know, I'm, I'm buying a car for the wife. And fantastic. So, and you, they're on 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 their own. You know, fucking crazy. People come in. It's a car for both of us. And they don't bring their their partner with them. Yeah. <laughs> Why the hell are you coming in? Here? I haven't told my wife. That's the best one. I haven't told my wife yet. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. That's great. So, 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 so I assume <laughs> then it's going to be a surprise gift for her. <laughs> oh no, no, she's she's got to see it. Okay, so fine. And now I know yeah, that she's got. To, so look, there's no point in me trying to close the deal if if there's a pact already yeah. there. If we're looking in, you know, for you, Pete, if you're looking in the commercial side. And I'm talking to the operations director, you know. So I assume from an operations director, you probably need to get the MD or the FD's approval on this. Would that be right? No, no, no. Fine, I, I can make these decisions on my own. Brilliant. Yes, yes. I, I, I need that third party, uh, another person. Great. Well, now I know the process. So rather than me showing you all the details of how this works, 
wouldn't it be best for us to get a meeting with them in place? Otherwise, I'm just going to repeat myself. I'm going to tell you all the features of this car, and then you're going to have to relay that to them. So let's let's stop this meeting. Let's have a meeting later and bring that person in. Okay, so it's just a way to actually just don't go into the sales if because you get all the way through this and then say, yeah. oh, that's fantastic. So I just need to talk it to them with my wife. Great. Uh, that, that you've lost all of that momentum okay so once we've got the need now we need to move into the help and then the hurry so the help is right now I need to find the best product for you so based on what we've talked about this is these these are my options this is what I think is going to be best for you I can put in here my company and salesperson experience so you know I've sold yeah you know, I've sold one of these to, to to Fred the other day and he was over the moon with it yeah, in fact, here's his testimonial. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're just building again. We're building back a bit of trust, but we're building that, making sure that they understand we are best placed to actually get this across. Third party endorsements will be the testimonials. Then we move into the product features. So this is what it does. Yeah, we demonstrate the product, test drive. So imagine at this point here, test drive, mm -hmm. this, this is a done deal. Okay, we don't do the test drive down here because you know it's too early in the process. So, and then the one that I like is the three option close. Never give somebody one option because if you give them one option, what are you actually giving them? Yes or no. Yes or no. Yes or no. You're giving two options. Okay, if you give them three options, yeah, then no is twenty five percent of the options. 25% on three options, you said? Yeah, three options and a no. Oh, I see, okay. So 25%. Right, right. Okay, right. so the three option is, is the simplest way to think about this is basic, better, best. So, because certainly if, you, if you're doing your sales and you're getting some price objections, yeah, always have a low, lower price option. Okay, and for your upsells, have the one where you think you can get the upsell. Now, there's there's different ways of thinking with this. Yeah, some people say start with a high one, go in with the highest value thing you can sell. And say, look, I'm really not sure if this is in your budget. Okay, but I'd like you to look at it and see what you think. So you take them to the high value option. And then you, you assess from body language, you know, from what they're doing and saying as to whether they're at that or not. So that, I did think that was a pushing it a little bit much. But that's fine, okay, because what I've got is this option here. Okay, or you take them into the middle option and you say, well, look, this is the one I think is right for you, but if you want one, we've got one that's slightly better at a higher price or one with slightly reduced that might be sort of in, under your budget but I think for, for certainly for you know if you're selling product yeah and sometimes service in the need identification find the budget <clears throat> okay you've got to find you've got to find the budget because you know you, you waste so much time if you, if you don't have an idea. No one goes in to buy anything without a budget in their mind. They might say, well, I don't have a budget. They've got a budget. <laughs> everyone's, got, everyone's got a budget. Oh, that's fantastic. So there should be 15 million pounds in. Oh, that's not in my budget. Well, you must have a budget then. It's clearly not 15 million. Okay, so just so that I, so you basically say, just so that I can come up with the best deal for you, what, what are we talking about? Is it a, a figure per month? Is it a, is it, yeah, a figure that you've actually got? Give me a, give me a range. Exactly the same thing with somebody else. Wouldn't yeah. tell me to, what are you looking to say? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Two grand? No, 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 no. It's more, it's more than two grand. Is it ten grand? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Between, yeah. Somewhere for a brother. Well, some, some time, yeah, I don't know what, what I'm going to do. I said, I said to her, I said, I'm not going to find a van that's five grand and then tell you it's ten grand. I put it up by five. 
<laughs> yeah. Okay, so we've got to look at this and say, right, you know, through option close and uh, give you some options. At this level here, break the pack. So back here, we acknowledge the pack. If we've taken through at this point, we then need to break it. We need to actually assess whether we can do away with that agreement with, with the other party. So I, either we've bailed out here and we've gone away, but if they say, oh no, no, yeah, the, the wife's involved, but no, I can make the decision on my own. Yeah, you need to re reassess it here. So if you were to go back to your, to your wife and say that you've spent this amount of money on this product or service, how's she gonna feel? She's going to be, she's going to be bloody, yeah, that's, that's not going to work, is it? Okay, so you've got to understand, otherwise, if you don't do that, when you come to the close, they're going to say what? It's going to speak to my wife. I'm going to speak to my wife. Okay, and then, then as soon as you've done that, it's really hard to go back. But if you've done it early on, then you can say, well, what would you say? Yes. Okay, so yeah. So if we could if we could make this so that it works for her, yeah, you've, you've still got a chance to continue that sale. He's got some great examples in, in the book. And it's, it's an honourable video as well. So about uh, things like that. And then summary close. So all the way through this process, we should be trying. You're know, doing trial closes. So if I could if I could put you in that car, if I could put you you know, in that have that kitchen, if I could get that that uh, plumbing uh, that boiler done, are we ready to go right now? Oh no 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 okay fine I need to go a little bit further find a bit more information. Okay, and then the price really doesn't come until the end. Okay. Now what I think, yeah, if, if we're selling big ticket items, I would be putting the price down here. I think this is why I say I'll put the budget down here and have, look, we've, we've got cars from this range to this range, or kitchens from this range to this range, or electricity from this range to this range, so that we're setting that, we're, we're using that as our qualification. There's no point in getting to this point saying, it's gonna cost you 50 grand, we already got 20 grand. <laughs> oh, that's about that's about yeah. Okay, so so we've got to look at that, and then the price. Once, as soon as we say the price, we should be then ready to say yes or no. Okay. So so this is we're now starting to think about this should now be a process. Okay, so when we do a sale, if we can repeat this process, building trust, mm. identifying the need, showing how we help, how we close, then we can repeat it. Then we can get better at it, and ultimately, we can hand it over to somebody else. In my experience of salespeople, is there are no brilliant salespeople. There are brilliant sales processes. Okay, now it might be a person that's learned a really good process and repeats that, that makes a brilliant person. How do you actually, that's very well, right? Yep. How do you actually implement that in your own, yeah, real world? So the first thing would be to write it down. So this is our process. So when somebody comes in, this is what we do. This is a script that we use to start with. These are, these are the questions that we use to identify the need. Yeah, these are our product, this is what we do. Our you know, our three option closes, mm -hmm. so you can have just a car, you can have mm -hmm. a car with a warranty, you can have the full warranty that gives you peace of mind. Okay, so, so you, you write that process down and then you train the hell out of people. As I said, when they get it wrong, when you lose a sale, that's where you learn. Fantastic, well we didn't get that sale with Mrs. Miggins, why don't we get that? Let's look at the process. And where, where did they drop? Where did we fall, fall down? Really analyze it. Yeah, we didn't really get on. There's no commonality. You know, I was too busy. I was over here doing something else and she lost interest. Yeah, the price, you know, I, I gave her a car for this and the price was too high because I didn't 
identify that at a new stage. Okay, that's if you've got the process and you look at it in there, they're going to drop off somewhere along here. If they keep dropping off at a certain stage, you've got to, you've got to train that or put something in place to stop it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and that's that's the best way in sales is, is review, 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 review. Why did we lose it? Yeah, and the ones that we win, the ones we win, so that was an easy one. Why did we win that? Yeah, because we really. I nailed, I nailed that question within five minutes. I built that commonality, that rapport within three minutes. Okay, it's gonna be somewhere along here. I, I'm rubbish at this, I really don't ask that question. It's difficult, it's a difficult question to ask. You know, certainly if you've got a high D, you know, high D comes in, yeah? Who else, who else is involved in the process? Nobody else, it's me. You get to hear, oh, I've got to ask the wife. <laughs> Really? You're probably going to buy a kitchen, if you're a hundred thousand pound kitchen, and not ask your wife about it. Oh yeah, yeah, well, I suppose she's got to be involved. Of course she has. Okay. So there's this scenario where you where salespeople are generally very optimistic about where they are in the process and not necessarily I think there's a point when you lost the deal already, but you're not really listening to your intuition just carry on and and things like that how do you discover when i'm talking to a salesperson you wind back and say okay well where did we actually just do where did it actually drop out was it that point you just said or was it actually beforehand so i think i think the set that because for most of us the sales process is quite long yeah okay if we if we're managing a salesperson in that process and we're trying to we're trying to identify where we're wrong it's been a, we're not going to do that. No. What we've got to do is we've got to empower our sales team yeah, to understand, look, this is a process. Yeah, You're trying to get better. I'm here to help you. So, yeah. so you need, as a sales, you need to tell me. I'm not, I'm, I'm not here to manage you with this. I'm here to coach you yeah. so that you, you know where you failed. Yeah, And then I'll help you get better. If, if yeah. they see failure as a negative, yeah. It's oh my god, yeah, you know, I've lost this sale and you know yeah, Keith's yeah, gonna yeah. come in and he's never gonna go at me and we haven't achieved our sales targets. Oh, I'm not gonna say that I messed up. It's gonna be well it's their fault. Yeah. It was COVID 19s fault, it was this yeah, fault, yeah. it was that yeah. fault. And as soon as yeah. you're in blame, excuse, and denial, you're not gonna grow. Yeah, no, definitely. Okay. So so it's empowering the sales team. So for us, for, if we're doing the sales, we've got to do it ourselves. But if it's the uh, the sales team. You know, we've got to empower them to go right now you know the process now you know where it could go wrong and it will go wrong yeah your job is to identify mm. it and then learn and then talk to me yeah. as your manager about what can we do next time to make yeah. it better yeah. otherwise you're just going to make the same mistakes over and over and over again freedom to fail freedom to fail yeah that's really important okay so Empathy. So we've, we've talked about this EQ, this, you know, empathy is really where it comes in. So we've got three tools of communication. The words we use, our voice and our body language. Okay, so in communication, where do you think most communication takes place? Is it the words? All right, so the words we use our tonality or body language. Body language. Yep. So 10% words, 38% voice, 55% body language. Okay, so when we talk about scripts, we talk about sales scripts. Yeah, what we're talking about here is not necessarily the actual words. Yeah. It's the confidence to put across the right voice and the right body language. And this is why sales is a confidence thing. If you're not confident, you might say the right things, but you ain't gonna get the sale. And this is why they say salespeople go on streaks. You either have a winning streak or you have a losing streak. Yeah? Because the, losing, the winning streak builds 
confidence, yeah. yeah, which builds means your tonality and your body language is strong. A losing streak means mm, am I saying the right things? Yeah. And basically, you might be saying it, but they're hearing the wrong thing. Okay, and so that's why it's sometimes it's difficult to get out of a losing streak until you've, you've, you've got to change something. You've got to change the way I do things. You know, build that confidence back. Well, sometimes that's hard to find, actually. Sometimes it is. Yeah. And some, sometimes that people just don't get it. You know, they just, they're, it goes back to beliefs again. They believe they're now a crap salesperson. Mm -hmm. As soon as you believe you're a crap salesperson, guess what you're going to be? Crap salesperson. Okay, <laughs> okay. It, it's, it serves as such a comp because it's it's that ability to overcome that emotion of this is a rejection yeah. and therefore I'm a bad person. It's just a process. And if you believe in the process, you will become a better salesperson. You know, so I, when I when I joined Action Coach, you know, I'm an accountant, I've never sold anything in my life. Probably so. Sold, sold to the devil, yeah. <laughs> so that was easy. Um, so when I came into sales, you know, what gave me the confidence was that process. Because we, I was taught that process within a few uh, within a few months. So I thought, oh, great, I, I can hang my hat on that. If it goes wrong, I know it's not me; it's the process. I've just done a bit of the process wrong. It's not a personal insult. It's just I just didn't. I missed a step out. Like a recipe, you know. If I if I if I don't bake the cake as it should be, it's not me. Yeah, it's just I didn't read the recipe. And if I choose to bake a cake and not read the recipe and I get it wrong, I shouldn't be surprised. <laughs> okay. So this is really why it comes back to is all buying decisions are based on this logic and emotion. Left brain, right brain. Okay, neocortex, logic, limbic system, reptilian brain, emotion. Is that different for the disc profiles though? Would it be different percentages? Right. Really, so even, even the C would be as a high emotion. A bit more logical. It's probably, yeah, probably a little, but okay. don't forget C's relate emotion to logic. Okay, so for high C's, numbers are quite emotional. <coughs> High eyes numbers are not rational at all. Okay, but most all buying decisions are 20% logic, 80% emotion. There is a difference. There is one thing that, but a bottle you buy one thing that this doesn't, it's, almost, it's pretty much 100% logic. Anybody know what, where you, you have n virtually no emotion when you buy it? Okay. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, I was going to say buy a white. Very little emotion in it. Peter, listen, electric. <laughs> yeah, it's true. You need it. Well, there's a bit of emotion in there. Is that a product or is it a service? Um, it's sort of. It's a good question. <laughs> it's a bit of both, really. It's not a physical thing. Yeah. You have to do, you have to do it at least once a year. Not insurance. Insurance. Okay, so anything that you have to purchase, you're forced to purchase, becomes a logical, non-emotional. Okay, so when you buy insurance, what's the one thing that you you generally buy on? Price, because price is logical. Okay, and this, this is why all the go compare the market.com things came up because they knew people bought insurance on logic and therefore they built a website that was purely based on logic. But what of the, so when they market themselves though, what do they mark the compare the market sites? What do they market on? Logic or emotion? Do they just emotion, say emotion to drive, drive you to the. Side. Yeah, so how do they do that? Give me an example. A meerkat. A meerkat. Okay, so, so, that, so they've basically understood 
If you buy insurance on a logical base, then we're going to build a website that deals with logic. Yeah. But we're going to sell our comparison site based on emotion and based on the fact that you, you get a floppy toy. Okay, so we've got to understand that when we're selling, you know, are we selling a logical thing? Pete, you're selling more of a logical product, yeah? Or an emotional thing, kitchen. But a kitchen is also logical because it's a functional thing. A car is yeah. logical, a functional thing. But there's also heavy emotional thing inside. I think the, the emotion to be drawn out where there's a price comparison is the fear of paying too much. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, I, th I think that's something that the uh, comparison sites amplify. Yeah. Is, uh, it, it, it comes back certainly, as you, as you say, Pete, we, with you, it's about spending that money, you know, so let's do the calculation, let's do the, the price comparison. So with your current provider, it's going to cost you £2,000 a year. With us, it's going to cost £1,000 a year. So that's going to save you £1,000 a year. So what would you do with that money? Yeah, yeah. And um, bizarrely, with well, you, you, you know, electricity and gas, it's exactly the same gas that's pumped into your house or pumped into your building. There's no difference. Yeah. <laughs> it's just who sends you the bill. Okay. okay. But for you, for you, it's going to be more of a trust. Do I trust you to give me the best deal yeah, rather than the emotion of the electricity that comes through the wall? Okay, but we have to understand that it is this sort of logic and emotion. And when people are looking to change, so change providers, change cars, change kitchens, then our formula for change will come up. Okay, so we use this a lot. You know, our resistance to change yeah, has to be overcome by our level of dissatisfaction with where I am my vision of where I want to get to, and the first steps. Now, the sales process, yeah, the, the actual signing the agreements and doing that is predominantly first steps. Sign here, do this, and you'll be fine. Sign this paperwork, take this car away. That's the logical side of things. But we've got to understand the emotion and the dissatisfaction and the vision are the, are the key things. So when we do our questions, yeah, what we've got to be doing is saying, right, you know, I need identification. So what is it you dislike with what you've currently got? What keeps you up at night? You remember, you know, uh, with Stephen, I was talking about push, pushing his pain point. Does that hurt? How does that hurt? Okay, so that pain point is what drives that dissatisfaction. Now, I'm more likely to move away from pain than I will be towards pleasure. You can get me out of pain, I'll buy quite quickly. If it's a pleasure thing, how attached are you to the vision of what you want to buy? Mm. So high ticket, high vision things are more difficult to sell than things that get you out of pain. So if somebody's coming, I need a car because my car's broken down, that's great. Yeah? If I'm changing the car, this car that I actually quite like and I don't really want to sell, difficult. So our job in this questioning process is either, and either or, probably both, a bit of both, to identify the pain. So what is it you don't like about your current situation? Yeah. What is it about the vision? What is it about this? It's not about the product or the service. It's about how you will feel once you have changed. If, if, I, if I can assess you've got this amazing attachment to the future, then I've got the best chance of selling. Okay, so this is what's going on in their head. They've got a resistance, it might be high if they're at the left hand side of that buying curve, yeah, it might be low, but whatever's going on, we've got to get in there. We're either identifying their dissatisfaction and helping them to build a vision. And sometimes we have to help them, you guys, very much on the helping them to build a vision of what their future, because they might not know. Mm -hmm. you know. With a car, you know, we could build that. You know, with utilities, not quite as easy, but it's more about the money side of it. HR, take away the pain. 
you know, with with the uh, you know, we're selling the fat, you know, selling plants, you know, we're selling direct, we're selling things that are going to make people's lives better. So, so the way we identify this real need is. Give me clever bloody PowerPoint. <laughs> is we ask questions, we get an answer. We ask questions, we get an answer. We ask questions and we dig deep. We're digging down into that vision or the pain, whichever route we're taking. And we keep asking questions. And at some point, what we'll get from them is they will then ask us, we'll get to an emotion and they will ask us question and we can provide the answer okay, as soon as you get to the emotion and they ask a question so how can you help me how, how can you get me into that car that then you know you've got the slack sorry kevin i need to shoot okay cool See you later we were nearly done so we can catch up in the last few minutes okay. we started a bit late so Okay, so we just ask questions, we get an answer, ask questions, get an answer, and that conversation will go, and then suddenly they will ask you a question. How, 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 can, how do we do this? How can we go to that next level? Then you provide the answer, and the answer is the first steps, and right, the first step is we need to do this. Okay, so those questions are, should be written down, should be worked on, and, and you build a data bank of these questions that you can use and you can train and you can revise. Okay, so we're just looking at how we actually build this. And then, other things we're also looking is, not only do we identify people's this profile, but we can also identify their VAC profile. So are they a visual learner? Are they an auditory learner? Are they a kinesthetic learner? Because if, if they're visual, you know, we've got to show them stuff. Okay? <clears throat> if they're auditory, you know, they're going to want to hear things. Yeah? And if they're kinesthetic, they want to touch and feel it. Now, the majority of the population, as you see here, 80% of the population are visual kinesthetic. But if you do get an auditory person, that then you've got to make sure that they can, um, there's some form of sound that's going on. So that might be, that might be music playing. The question. Oh, <laughs> 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 this, this is, we, we're, we're getting into quite high level NLP techniques here. So, so NLP practitioners are really good at this. They'll, they'll use visual, auditory, or kinesthetic words to influence people. Okay, so, so that's sort of taking it to the next level uh, in sales. So you basically, you're influencing people through the words that you use. Okay, it's, 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 I, I did a course on it, and I'm, so I understand it. Am I very really good at it? No. Uh, so you, you do recognize someone when they can do that? Yeah. And you can pick up people, you know, if people are sort of saying, yeah, I hear what you say, then they're generally more auditory. Yeah, I see what, you, I see what you're coming at, it's visual, yeah, I feel, yeah, I'm, I'm getting a good feeling for this. There'll be more kinesthetic. Okay, but it's, it's like you've got to be on top of your game with that to, to actually pick those cues up. So then we want to hurry, so we want to make sure we close the sale. So follow up, follow up, follow up. Don't let it go. Yeah. And no is only a no now, not no never. Just because they said no doesn't mean you can't take their data and then keep in touch with them because at some point they may have a, have a better need for it. You might not have had a budget for your car at the end of the day, but that's fine. Yeah. And so had a great experience. Yeah. Okay, so, so this is why you need a CRM system, you know, you need a database where you can keep people's records because they just go back into the pot and they become remarketed, but they're at a high level of trust with you, you know, if you've treated them well, and therefore when they do come back, 
the sales process is going to be a lot shorter. Yeah, and this is this. I love this one. So why salespeople don't close? So 48% of salespeople never follow up. 25% will make a second contact. 12% will third contact. 10% of people uh, make more than three contacts. Okay, so 80% of sales are made on the fifth to the twelfth contact. So people give up far too soon. So I always say this with, with sales teams is half your sales team give up too soon and half your sales people hang on to dead donkeys. <laughs> yeah, because they're, they're too yeah. embarrassed to ask, do you want this or not? Yeah. Yeah. I'm generally a dead donkey figure. Yeah. <laughs> That's what they say about you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we keep it going, systemize it, you know, keep it, you know, systemize, so write down the process, what are the stages, you know, that trust, need, help, hurry, what is that, train it. You can put this process into the CRM system and you can monitor where people are in that process, okay, but you know, you're, you're there to make sure it's repeatable. Yeah, and that you can monitor it and see where you're doing well and where you need to improve. And you know, invest in a CRM system. You know, there's just a uh, an example of how many CRM systems there are. Mm -hmm. you know, and people say to me, "What CRM, CRM should I use?" No freaking idea. You know, there's there's so many of them. You know, try a few. But they all do the same thing. Find one and then just commit to it. What's a CRM, sorry? Client Relationship Management System. Is it our platform? Yeah, yeah. It's just, it's, a, it's basically to keep track of your customers so you can monitor the progress and you can set tasks and nothing gets missed. Yeah. You can do it on a spreadsheet in the early days, but eventually you're going to need to invest in one of these. If you want a free one, HubSpot is a really good free CRM system. Okay, so... Um, but they will try and upsell you onto their full paid version, which is quite expensive. But if you just if you can ignore that, you get a free CRM. Otherwise, they're from probably 10, 15, 20 pounds a month. So it's not a massive expense. So before you do that, map out your process. Get your process right, then find a CRM system. Okay, a CRM system won't solve your problems. Yeah. You've got to solve your problems, understand your process, then put it into a CRM system. Okay, because it's that whole adage, garbage in, garbage out. You know, if you put garbage into a CRM system, you get garbage out. I'm still suffering from my CRM system because in the early days, I uploaded 15,000 cold bits of data. Okay, now I've got 15,000 leads in my system that aren't leads. So I've spent 10 years clearing <laughs> it out. So, and you know, put your, your scripts together, write things down, how you approach, you know, and checklists as well. Have they done certain stages? And that, that way you can so systemize it and then get somebody else to do it. Oh, so apologies for overrunning, uh, but we say technical issues have uh, left us a bit late. So the homework, home fun for you to do. Number one, measure your real conversion rate. Look back. If you can't, if you don't have the stats, at least start from now going forward. Okay, and, and understand you might have multiple conversion rates. So if you do, then, then measure those. Look at your limiting beliefs. So you know, really think about you with sales. You know, how do you feel? What's your identity around sales? You're a competent salesperson, or you're not a competent salesperson? Uh, do your disc profile. Okay. So um, if, if anybody wants that, we can we can do those. Uh, they're, they're only about 20, 25 pounds uh, each to do a disc profile, um, and then prepare that sales process. Trust, need, help, hurry. What are your stages in that? It doesn't have to be that, you know, use post-it notes on a wall, okay? So but just put something down that you can understand how you take people through from you know, a reasonably cold lead right the way up to a, 
a signed gripe. So, and do that and then improve, you know, learn, prepare to fail, but learn from your mistakes. So, yeah, so, yeah Peter's using HubSpot, so, uh, so that's good. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, so any, any questions that people have got? And what's so anything you want me to answer that to you put on your what you want to get out of the day that I haven't dealt with? Uh, and what's the one thing you take away in action you're going to take as a result? So we'll start in the room. So, so Keith, um, oh, oh, Pete, do you want you, you, you to start, Pete? Yeah, I thought it was Pete, but it could be someone else. Um, so the um. Just going back to the thing that I, I wanted to um, understand a bit more at the start was uh, moving people along that, that sales process, um, responding quicker to requests for information. Um, and I, I, I guess it's um, the takeaway is understand who your prospect is and how they operate rather than trying to crowbar them into your own process, Yeah, uh, I think. I think need to think about that as well. Cool. Good. Stuart? Um, loads of good stuff there, actually. Yeah, I can't, I can't, I, um, the, the things to take away, uh, there's, there's lots to take away. So I've been, I've been um, taking notes um, and some screen prints as well while I've been going along. And it's, um, there's some really good stuff there. So yeah, really good. Great. Cool. Good. Chris? So three option close. So I use it two option close. Okay. Um, yeah, we can start. Oh, so two, two can work, yeah. you know. Uh, but try, try three and see if see if it helps. Uh, yeah. Uh, fire the sales team. Don't don't blame the sales person. Blame the sales process. Yeah. 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 The four stages of learning, which I know, yeah. obviously. But just the way you went through it in a slightly different perspective, I thought was really that was, that was really good. I like to count this phrase for me, just thinking that um, selling through education yep. and selling through curiosity, which I thought was yep. that was really good. Curiosity is about really discovering the deeper needs of someone and just being interested yep. to, to discover. But actually, that that dual thing you're doing, because if you can educate them, you find value and worth and things. And once you've got curiosity which is a lovely way to discover something yeah. about somebody and what their real issues are it's just yeah. a lovely word it's not as offensive that, you know, not as and that's, that's why so, so you know the pushy salesperson is just a lazy salesperson it's just because you know for me sales is great because i get to meet somebody i get to mm -hmm. understand yeah. more about them and i get to help them yeah it should be people driven not product so yeah, and if it's, if what I've got isn't right for you, then I should be willing to say, well, actually, look, what I've got isn't yeah. fit for yeah. you. So try here and here and here. Yeah, and, I'll, I'll and then they'll go, oh, that's fantastic, and they'll tell their friends, and mm. somebody else will come back. Yeah. Good, Amanda. Um, so the, oh, what I wanted to get was about the questions, but it's just prompted me that we could sit down with the team and just brainstorm some questions based on all knowing the same environment that we're in. And um, just the disc profiles explained a bit more as far as how to identify. I, I heard Helen and I talked about them, but being able to actually try and pick it immediately and change in chameleon in yeah. a way. That's, I just want to think about it a bit more. Yeah. It's good. And I would say, I haven't talked about uh, Leslie. Yeah, that's probably something that's going to help her as well. Because to, yeah, she did the head to watch this, I think. Mm, I think it would be really helpful. Yeah. She was, she's off sick today, so yeah. she would have. Mm. Yeah. Um, that's recording. Yeah. Yeah. Good. So thanks everybody. Yeah, good to have you on online and uh, have a great uh, yeah, put, put that lot into action. And uh, yeah, we're here to help you if you need us. So uh, take care guys and uh, we'll see you soon. Much appreciated. Take care. Take care everybody. Yeah. Are we still good tomorrow, Kevin? Uh, yes, yeah, you're in the diary. So we'll have a chat tomorrow. Lovely. I'll speak to you in okay. the morning. Cheers. Cheers. Bye. Oh, God. It's been a hot all week.